Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Molly Martin and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. And today you will be doing another episode of Inside Out, where we discuss ideas from the heartland, in this case from Indiana, that we think are useful and scalable to other parts of the country. This is a special part of Inside Out, a series we call Youth America, youth-led policy in the heartland. Youth America is a storytelling for action project between New America and Voices. We'll hear more about voices in just a moment. And our goal is to help youth policy advocates safely share their stories and ideas to improve and reinvent the systems intended to serve and protect young people in Indiana and beyond. Today, we're so honored to be joined by Legend West and Daniel Dabney, both of whom are youth policy fellows with voices. Daniel's in Lake County, Indiana, and Legend is in Grant County. And as, in addition to being a youth policy fellow, Legend is also a social services professional. We're also joined again today by Lauren Hall, Senior Leadership Team Member of Voices and a New America Indianapolis IUPUI Fellow and Kia Wells, Founder and Executive Director of Voices. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you'll join the conversation by asking your questions and leaving your comments in the chat or going online and joining us at hashtag Youth America on Twitter. I'm really excited to dive in because today our Youth Policy Fellows are going to take a deeper dive into education funding and youth support funding and school funding formulas, things that not not everyone assumes young people are interested in, and yet young people are the most impacted by the decision. So before we dig in with Daniel and Legend, I'd love to turn to you, Kia, and talk to you a little bit about voices. We have folks joining us from Indiana and also folks from across the country, and I think they'd be really interested in your model. Well, first, thank you so much, Molly, for having us. Uh, we are always grateful for this platform and to elevate the voices of the young uh, adults that are working with us. Um, voices was started about 10 years ago. My background's in juvenile probation, and it really was born out of the need just to um, create some culturally relevant programming that addressed a lot of the root causes of uh, the violence that we were seeing in the neighborhoods. And so at the time, all of my friends were artists, and I brought that into the work to help bring that you know neutral zone and safe space for young people to be able to discuss what was going on with them. Fast forward 10 years later and we are working with Department of Child Services, um, juvenile probation, and really keeping that model of just centering them in our programming and making sure that we create these spaces for them to be able to advocate um, for th things that happen you know in their past and you know that attributed to the systems that they were involved in. Um, so we're really excited to be able to continue this work. Um, last year, we got really intentional about training young folks to be leaders um, and to really kind of push that platform in their narratives a little bit further. Um, we're just expanding on that with the different partnerships. We were um, awarded some funding recently that'll allow us to continue this work for a couple of years going forward. And so we're really excited about this new partnership coming up um, and just creating these safe spaces for kids. Thank you so much, Kia. You can learn more about Voices and I will drop a link in the chat actually. And I believe, is it voicescorporation.org, Kia? What's your URL? It's voicescorp.org. Voicescorp.org. We'll drop that in the chat. Thank you. So Daniel, I'm going to come to you first. I'd love to hear a little bit more about who is Daniel? Uh, what brought you to this advocacy journey? What brought you to Voices? And what sorts of issues are you particularly passionate about? Daniel? Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Daniel. And I was brought into the Youth Voices program through my mom's job, Indiana Parenting Institute. Youth Voices reached out to Indiana Parenting Institute, and they reached out to me. And through them, I was able to get connected to the Youth Voices program in August. Since then, I have been trying my best to be a good advocate. Uh, at the time, I was dealing with advocacy with housing and homelessness. I'm currently dealing with advocacy around racism. Um, thanks to Lauren, I recently gained the ability to write an article about racism that I'm nearly finished with and could hopefully spread my wisdom and my story to the world. And I am very passionate about things like racism and homophobia and sexism. And I look forward to finding, finding ways to fix those issues. Excellent. And I have faith that you can fix those issues and I'm looking forward to watching it for sure. So thank you so much, Daniel. We'll get back to, to you in a moment. But Legend, I'd like to come to you. And same question. Tell us a little bit about your advocacy journey and what brought you to Voices. My name is Legend West, um, and I got plugged into Voices um, on the 
I'm a member of the Journey Fellowship, which is a social worker fellowship in Indiana funded by the Lilly Endowment. And someone had shared the application for the Voices program on our um, Journey Facebook page. And I was really interested in getting more involved um, in policymaking in Indiana and was so fortunate to um, you know, have a little part of the program uh, and to meet Lauren and Kia and Brandon and Miss China. Um, who've yeah, just given me so many amazing opportunities. Um, as far as what I feel most passionate about uh, going forward in you know, my ability to influence or impact things. Um, I have worked in the foster care field the last two years. I'm a, I guess I'm a foster care graduate. Um, I came out of the foster care system. And uh, right now, I, I guess like overall, if I could like, as just far as like, um, finding equity and social justice um, and getting to like the root of those things, like where those things are caused um, and, you know, finding class, you know, uh, class solidarity and um, I guess just overall just very passionate about social justice. Thank you so much, Legend. Uh, hearing younger people say class solidarity warms my ancient heart. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear all this energy. This is great. Before we talk a little bit more about some recent advocacy that Legend and Daniel have done, Lauren, would you tell us a little bit about this process by which youth policy fellows engage with Indiana lawmakers? Sure. Um, first off, uh, I think it's really important to know that um, brilliance is latent within our, our students, our youth, our young adults. Um, and so it's really uh, been a learning journey. I think, you know, every sort of teacher is um, really intentional about learning with and from their students. Um, and I would, I would orient in a similar fashion. So I would say throughout our journey together, you know, Legend, Daniel, their, their peers were certainly um, engaged in the process of you know, mapping their personal experiences onto collective experiences, onto systems, which are, you know, of course, ruled by these different policies. Um, and just being super transparent with you, I think I fake it really well with Daniel and Legend. I mean, they're over here thinking I like write policy and do things. And, um, you know, I think I'm enough to be dangerous. And I think it's just, um, you know, when I started and, and now that, you know, I've channeled forward, I think we are all just much more equipped to interrogate those systems, the policy, um, and, and realize that at the root of it, right, like policy and, and systems have people in them. And so I think what has been so profound um, is that what we've kept intentional um, as part of our program is this fact that people are what make up society, what make up policies, what make up systems. And so therefore, how do we hold truth to our own stories, our own triumph over trauma and, you know, uh, rooting and healing and how do we um really look at again their rules right um and i know um i've certainly heard this before and i'm i think it's Brittany packnett cunningham i think i've heard it from a few other folks just talked about rigged rules right and so really trying to understand how are these rules i.e policies rigged um even not intentionally right um and i think that's been a big learning for me um is just the fact that really uh, helping myself and folks in the program um, to see all sides and still be able to come out of that and, and seek aspects of solidarity amongst folks who are who are not benefiting from these rigged rules. Um, so that was very abstract and passion centric. Um, logistically, it was truly competitive application. We had to turn away some youth who I, who I think are, you know, incredible, um, had just as much conviction, um, but we really wanted to keep it to a small group. From there, we broke them into cohorts. Um, they worked in, on policy issues. As Daniel mentioned, he was working on housing and homelessness. Legend was actually the first one to bring up specifically before there was even legislation and bigger conversation about school funding. She said, I care about school funding issues, which was like, oh, interesting. OK. Um, and so just helped them journey along in understanding that content knowledge, as well as the shared systems knowledge and policy knowledge required to advocate. They spoke with legislators to cohort two cohorts actually submitted policy um, that manifested in different um, pushes in the state house this year. And um, then we were able to follow on with that advocacy prior to the session by having Legend and Daniel come to the state house. Great, and that must have been quite a journey. I, you know, I'm not sure 
when the first time I was in a state house was, but I was probably around your age and I would have been terrified. Uh, so let's get to that. Let's talk about what it was like going to advocate to Indiana lawmakers. And Daniel, I'd love to start with you and let's kind of start uh, with the end and we'll work backwards in the story. Once you were talking to your, your representatives, folks who really work for you, what were you asking for when you talked to your Indiana lawmakers this last visit, this last opportunity? When I went to the state house, I went there to ask for more funding for special education. I chose that topic because my brother is a person with autism. And for the past two years, he and my family have been struggling to help him get the quality education that he needs because he's a special ed student. And I decided that this, is, this would be the perfect opportunity for me to go about helping him with that. And I basically told them that my school my school has many different programs like many other like many other schools that do special education but these programs are not full of people who are entirely qualified or entirely have the resources to help my brother get the quality education he needs and i go to 21st century charter school at gary and this is the school that kind of considers themselves to be a specialty school and if a specialty school is struggling then the other schools are definitely going to be struggling so i figured that it's it's a it's a perfect time to to advocate about this stuff because i don't think that people are paying attention to special ed students the way that they need to otherwise this would not be happening so that's basically why i went to the state house and why i talked about what i did that's fantastic. So you're not off the hook with me yet, Daniel. I, I'd love to know, you're, you're looking at the supports available to disabled people, people who need special education, your brother who has autism, as you said. What, where's the money going if it's not going to support people with the highest need? As a student, where do you see funding and support going in Gary schools? I definitely believe that all of the funding that is supposed to be distributed to people with special education is definitely going to neurotypical people who they believe are at the high end of the education. Like it's the gifted student, the gifted students and the highly intelligent students that they believe need to have all this all this funding and all these resources to help them succeed because those are who they consider to be like the face of their schools the ones most worthy of the funding and resources that they get that's really astute and so as you're watching school systems essentially make bets on folks that they think are going to come out further ahead or on top. That must be incredibly frustrating. And so you and your family are advocating with and for your brother for supports. Were you ever asked, what do you need? Or did you always have to ask someone else and, and volunteer what you needed? That's a good question. I never really thought about that before, but off the top of my head, I don't believe that I've ever that I've ever really had to ask for these types of things until until this COVID thing happened. Like I truly believe that co that COVID when it started, it revealed a lot of the secrets in this country, especially in the form of education. But I never really had to deal with these issues to the extreme that I did until COVID happened, and I feel like that really changed my outlook on things and I probably wouldn't have even considered it had that not happened and kick-started all these events. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. So I'll be back, Daniel, to hear more about your journey in a moment, but Legend, I'd love to come to you. So even though Daniel has a personal passion and reason for pursuing increased special education funding, it sounds like you were the first in the cohort to say educated fund education funding is where the action is. That's where I want to be. How did you land there? Um, to begin answering your question, uh, when I went into foster care and kind of like all through my public school journey, it was always teachers that, um, you know, stood in the gap that were very much like the unsung parents, like that, you know, I very much pay a lot of respect and like, oh, like homage to them for kind of who I've become today. Um, and I've lived in Marion, Indiana for the last since 2016 to the last like almost five years. 
Um, and it's one of the, you know, Grant County is one of the most impoverished populations in Indiana. Um, and Marion in particular is predominantly, you know, full of black kids and um, super impoverished and there's very little industry. Uh, my college roommate is a teacher um, just down the road and my, my husband actually is a teacher at the same school. Um, and over the last two years, seeing them work in the school system and just to hear, uh, you know, every single year for the last five years, the superintendent has had to cut, you know, $1 million from the school budget. And I'm just like, where is that? Like, what are you not, you know, what is, what, how, how much is this depriving the students of, you know, the people that these students need, um, the materials up to date, you know, uh, her curriculums. And so, you know, having two people that I care very much about and, you know, in my, my full-time job that I was doing, um, I had, you know, children who were in foster care then in these school systems and uh, foster care social workers rely so much on the school because um, after the foster parents, there would be kids the most, right? If I was visiting a kid, you know, once or twice a month, I'm going to get just as much information from their teacher about how this child's doing as I am from the foster parents. So as a foster care social worker, schools are the pinnacle. They are so valuable to us. Um, and when I got plugged in with Lauren and I was like, hey, I'm not really sure where I fit in in this crowd. This is something that I really care about and I'd love to know what I can do um, because I feel like for most of my life, I'm like, oh, I care a lot about this, but I have absolutely no idea how to influence it or you know, who do I have to yell at? <laughs> um, and having the opportunity when Lauren called me up, I was like, yes, this is awesome because navigating, you know, I think that there are so many barriers, right? Between um, how I feel and what I see happening to the Marion Community School Corporation. And then who do I like getting from here to here and kind of saying like, hey, just so you know, this is what's happening to these students because of the money you're taking away from the school system. And um, so I'm interested, I don't even know, I feel like I lost myself the beginning, from the beginning of your question. No, I've got you, I've got you. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I think what I'm hearing, and it's, it's a clear tale, is you were looking around as a person who had experienced being lost in the shuffle. You were working with students who are being lost in the shuffle, and you're getting a headline from, from somewhere, from on high, that says million dollars out the door. And you're looking around and thinking, what is a, a better use of our money than this? You know, schools are asked to do a lot, uh, but they're also one of our only ways to keep track of what's happening with our youngest people. And, and so when you feel that way, Legend, and I can tell it's something you feel very personally and passionately, how do you communicate that to a lawmaker who has maybe limited time? How do you do it quickly? So thankfully, uh, I think we gave ourselves two minutes. <laughs> I think, you know, when Lauren and Sarah were prepping us, they said, uh, with this subcommittee, you'll have two minutes to testify. And I was like, how do I, you know, ring the most out of two minutes, get these people to like leave and care about what I said. Um, so how did we get there? So um, we had to be there by, I think we ended up saying one o'clock. So I drove an hour and a half from there in Indiana to get there. And then we waited until the, the session was over, which uh, they like pushed back the time so far that they couldn't push it back anymore. They got to like the very last time that it was like, hey, we're, we have to start the session. Um, and I think it was probably like six o'clock by the time we got to the subcommittee. Um, and then there were a few people in line ahead of us, but Lauren is like so proactive. And not only was she like so like practical and kind about it, but like she just got it done. She was like, I have youth here and they need to speak and this is important. And she was, <laughs> was like, wow, that's who I want to be when I grow up. Um, and so thankfully, because um, my husband was there with me and he and I, you know, we were committed to getting Daniel back home, who Daniel was traveling from me, from Gary, Indiana. So two and a half hours from Indianapolis. So poor Daniel was in the car so much this day, just for two minutes. And he made them count. Like I, I'll let him speak for himself, but he made them count. Literally when Daniel left the, the subcommittee room, everyone in that hall clapped for him because, yes, because he's a great advocate. 
Um, so you get two minutes typically. And we, I, I just kind of, uh, Lauren and Sarah prepped us like use your story. Um, and then like have your big ask, make sure they know what your ask is. And my ask in particular was, I'm a social worker. Um, I'm familiar with foster care. Uh, the schools are super important to our kids. And I'm asking that you consider, you know, these two things in particular, um, how many English language learners are in a school system, as well as how many kids are on free and reduced lunch. And interestingly, um, when COVID, the pandemic began, Mary Community School Systems began giving free and reduced lunch to all of their kids. And I, I thought that that was what the whole state was doing, but that's just unique to Marion because they know the level of need the kids have. And be the beginning of the fall 2020 school year, kids have been back in session and Marion Community Schools because the school, like the kids needed the school. So um, I care really a lot about the school corporation in particular. And when Sarah shared with us kind of like what the budget for this, for the next two years looks like, they're just like a little bit of joy, like maybe those two minutes counted. I'm confident they did. I, I will say I am not sure anyone has the power to move a lawmaker like younger people do, to be honest. But you've hit on something really important there, Legend. I actually want to talk to you about it, Kia. So Kia, when you are working with systems-involved youth or youth who've been attracted to a policy program, you're dealing with passionate people. You are dealing with people who are probably rightfully angry about the way things work. How do you coach your colleagues, your youth colleagues, and your charges to take that anger and condense it and, and make sure that it stays the wind beneath the wings of something that's maybe a little more concise and sometimes a little dispassionate? I mean, how do you even begin? No, I think that's always the balance, right? You know, and helping the kids kind of channel the energy. Um, but I think more of the challenge for us is with the adults and trying to get their, their mind wrapped around kids being experts, right? And we fight really, really hard to make sure that they are at every table that we're at, that they're prepared to be at these tables and that folks take them serious, you know? Most of our kids, as you said, are system impacted from either juvenile justice to mental health addiction. There's, we touch all of the systems. And, you know, we were really intentional when we started this youth leadership program that those were the, the ones that needed to have this, this platform. You know, they were the closest to the issues that we're trying to solve. And so it really, when we're working with these young people, that's the easy part for us, right? Because we get all of our energy from them. And you know, their innovation, the way that they see things, you know, that helps us kind of create this, you know, this programming, you know, for, again, the hardest part is the adults in the room, you know, shifting that power to the young people in the communities that are most impacted. And so, I mean, to see them transform the way that they have and to see them change the narrative of, you know, whatever system they're connected to, to see them grow in their power, it's amazing. You know, you can't beat the feeling. I mean, you guys hear them on here now. It's like, I'm just sitting back chilling. <laughs> I mean, they're incredible young people. And I think that we're, you know, as a society are coming into, you know, this space where we're starting to understand that, you know, they need to be front and center and that they need to be the ones driving all of this policy change. Well put. And I think that you've highlighted the thing that is the biggest problem, right? We tend to, if we have some power, we tend to get afraid or nervous or we begin to other the people who are really living the experience we're trying to address. And I have to believe that age is a big part of that. I'm sure race and gender are also huge parts of that. So clearly you did, you did something right. All of you did something right because Daniel walks in and the place explodes in applause. So Daniel, tell me about that. When you were preparing your testimony and you're coming all the way from Gary and that's a hike and you're being pushed back and waiting, waiting and, and just kind of enjoying the bureaucracy. And all of a sudden you're facing down some people who want to go home, who think you're too young, who believe they've heard every sad story. Tell me about the, the mental preparation, even the academic preparation you did. How'd you get there? 
it took a lot for me to to even consider doing this. Like when I got the news from Lauren, like I immediately went into full panic mode, and I mean literal panic mode. I like had a panic attack for the first time a week before that. And I it was just tearing me apart for an entire day. And I asked her if I could sleep on the issue. And some way, somehow, some miracle, I had a dream that literally told me to do this. And I have no idea. I had no idea why. And to a degree, I still don't know why that happened. But after that, I knew that I had to do this now or I, it was going to eat up my conscience later. So I do all this research. I... I come to the conclusion that I want to do special education, like I said earlier. So um, we get ready to go there, and I'm I'm in this like three hour three hour drive with Lauren, and we're talking and we're getting my stuff together, and I'm feeling a lot more confident than I was before. We even had a Zoom meeting before then, and I was feeling so confident. I had all of this confidence, and all of the panic just went away until I got to the state house, and they delayed this meeting multiple times. And it's it's like with every delay, I got increasingly more nervous and even more panicky to the point where I even had to step aside and I had to call some people or text some people and pace back and forth in this own in this private area until I was finally able to get in there and talk to them. And I came in ready. I had everything in my head. And then for some weird reason I just lost everything and i froze and that that's really something huge for me because i do not freeze and i know that sounds like that might sound somewhat egotistical but i never freeze in these situations when i speak i speak and i say what i want to say the way i want to say it but here all of that just went out the window and i was just frozen in fear and luckily for me a uh, senator senator eddie melton who who is a person who's always around me but i never get to interact with him he was at my school he's at my mom's job but i never met him and he helped me feel a little bit more confident in that time when i was just frozen and then there was another senator who asked me a question and through her asking me that question i was able to get back on track and i said everything that i needed to say but not necessarily everything that i wanted to say even and i was a little bit disappointed because I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. And then everybody gave me this huge applause when they when I came out and talking about how brave it was. And I got to meet Senator JD Ford and he gave me this this label pen, this really rare label pen and a bottle of water, which I desperately needed then. And then I got support from Lauren and Legend and her husband Noah and I got to listen to some really cool music from Legend on the way home and everything just became so much better afterwards. Like I felt so disappointed in myself for like for freezing when I typically don't freeze. But after looking back on what I did, even going there, saying what I needed to say, having the support of all my friends, it, just, it was just like it didn't even matter anymore. I love that story. And, and hopefully there are some policymakers watching now or maybe watching in the future and listening to what a difference it can make when our representatives are in community with us. We should be working on policy development together, asking questions, cheering people on, wanting them to succeed, even in times when we disagree. So it sounds like you knocked it out of the park, but you did say there were some things that you wanted to put out into the ether that you didn't get to. Now's a great time. So Daniel, is there something that you didn't get to say to the Indiana lawmakers that you'd love to get on video today? Um, right now, I, I can't really think of it because um, what I wanted to say to them was something that was very specific to my school in terms of the, the programs that were going on. And I believe it has something to do with with like there's a separation of time there is the normal time that people with neurotypical education typically get and then there's a special education and the special education takes out of the regular education and that just like and they call it um extra time when in reality you're just sectioning off time you're not really giving extra time and this extra time that i'm talking about 
is is those programs where Kai is Kai is my um, he's my brother that I'm talking about, and that's the only time that he ever gets to actually learn anything, because he, those those are when he's surrounded by the people who know how to deal with him and are able to give him what he needs to succeed. And when he's back in class with other kids and he's like distracted or doesn't get the attention he needs because there's like 20 other kids in the class with him, he's not learning as much as he needs to. So he's it's not really extra time in the way that they're saying it if he's not even getting the normal time that we're talking about. And that's what I wanted to say to him. That's really instructive. And I think it's one of those first lessons of policymaking and yet we forget it all the time ask the people who are living it, how does this feel? When we call it extra, are you getting enough time? When do you learn? So I'm, I'm really glad that you raised that here today. So legend you said, and Daniel said something similar, I hope it made a difference. I hope I did a good job. And I think it's clear that both of you did. And as luck would have it, and, and you contributed to this work, there was a positive development last week on, on the education funding front here in Indiana. And I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about how that how it felt reading that news, what you understand of that news. Before I begin, I will, what was, I, I wanted to like interject and make sure Daniel is not selling himself short. What he showed us was the power of engaging them in conversation. Um, and we, afterwards, we were like, that it was a pause. It was a very powerful, strong pause. Um, and when he came back in, he engaged them in conversation. We applauded because of, because how intentional his thoughts were. And like, he really broke down the barrier. Like, so it was like, oh, here's this stage, here's a podium, you have your two minutes, but Daniel engaged them in conversation. Um, and that is, that was just so much. It was just very powerful. Um, for your question, as far as um, how it felt reading through the article, we kind of broke this down with Lauren and Sarah, thankfully, um, getting through the jargon. So school, public schools are a, a great equalizer, I guess. Um, they kind of level, I, it's not a great term, they level the playing field and in Indiana, we have, I think it's like Indiana is one of the biggest voucher programs or has the biggest voucher program. Um, and so the shift kind of moving away and whenever that happens, it's people with power and money that get a better education. Uh, whereas like the people who, who need the resources don't, and it's usually kids in public schools. Um, and I, I've learned so much through this, right? And so to read through that, and to feel grateful that, okay, you know, this is a step in the right direction. Um, but then to see there are dissenting voices that are saying, you know, like, oh, well, this isn't the last of what we, what we want for this voucher program. It's just really interesting because I, because I will always advocate for people over profit. Um, and I think that in, in the United States and in the Midwest, there's a lot of like, well, I want my individuality. I want to make the choice for myself. And if that choice that you get to make for yourself, um, sometimes that means like taking away something from someone else. And it, it, yeah, it's been really, really fascinating just to learn and kind of be humbled. And, um, you know, there's still so much that I don't know and wanting to be on the right side of history and, and making things, um, you know, better for the kids at the least. Excellent. I'm so glad you are. Lauren, Legend talked a little bit about this development in terms of taking a little wind out of the sails of a move towards more voucher dollars and, and kind of reallocating those in different ways. What was your reflection on, on some of these developments that we've seen from the State House in the last week? Sure. So I, uh, you know, since we are not convened here just to dive into complexity funding, I'm not going to turn on to extreme teacher mode and try and like analyze all the different processes, both because um, I don't think I'd completely do it justice and also secondarily because I think as I reinforce to Legend and Daniel and their peers, um, you know, often it's the fact that um, complexity funding, kind of you heard Legend say jargon, right, um, working through the jargon, the idea of complexity funding, right, is brother, you know, they, 
they um, deserve some complexity beyond just one student equals this amount. And so therefore, if we are thinking about that, what are ways we can make our equation complex to validate and value and put money behind um, the resources uh, folks need to be able to thrive. And so we did see good movement. Um, and again, you know, kudos, we've been bringing it up, but um, I think what um, an, an underlying thread of this story too is that we are doing this as part of a movement, right? The Indiana teachers across the state of Indiana, um, teachers locally through tapes, you know, we have been um, educated by and with, and, um, you know, it's been mutually beneficial for us to think about our kids have these experiences and these passions and these understandings. How do we educate one another? Um, so I'm getting a little off track, but my point is simply that, um, you know, I think that we see a our state getting more educated about complexity funding. I mean, Daniel and Legend were not the only ones testifying, right? The reason why I was doing my, um, you know, judicious, professional, relational self in advocating for them to, to go early and go together um, was because, you know, everyone showed out, you know, uh, superintendents from multiple school districts across the state, some of the biggest, you know, nonprofit leaders, folks were just here. Um, so I love the development, I would say the big things are one, that people are getting more educated about how money is being spent and they realize how much it matters. Two is that the biggest sticking point for me is that the fact that we've seen complexity funding in recent years actually not go to the schools that one might rationally think need it, right? High percentage of low-income students. Um, and instead you see that, that formula leading to increased inequity in school funding, even though it's meant to do the opposite. I would say the third thing, which huge kudos to Daniel, and I think uh, this feels like such an important point to make, Daniel was speaking about special education, we saw a huge increase commitment in special education funding. And I deeply believe that, um, you know, as Legend said, the, the conversational tone Daniel was able to bring, as well as just that vulnerability and that emotiveness. Um, I think it, it being, you know, with love, um, you know, I think created a space amongst um, amongst very tired, beleaguered elected officials um, that they were they were tapping into their humanity in a way that was just unique and different and profound. Um, so I believe that that success we see in special education increase, definitely Daniel was part of the collective movement to make that happen. Um, super proud of them. And I think just on that note around his, his whether he causes it a freeze or legend causes it, you know, a, a thoughtful pause. Um, I think what I noticed about that moment is that I feel so often sometimes people avoid the idea of doing youth leadership development or or even bringing diverse voices, whether that be age, race, class, background, geography, what have you, um, because there is this acknowledgement that tokenization, we don't want that, right? Um, at the end of the day, Daniel and Legend could have been tokenized, right? Whether it be by their um, you know, age, their racial identity, where they were coming from. Um, and I think what's so powerful is that, you know, as Daniel mentioned, um, Eddie Melton spoke up and said, you know what, like Daniel, you are representing, right? So the idea that you're not a token here, Daniel, like I am breaking down that wall for you. You're representing like a whole group of people. We hear you advocating for your brother. Um, and so really being critical, um, as educators, as policymakers, and not tokenizing people, but thinking, wow, they are a representative voice, and knowing that that is multiple and intersectional, um, because not only was he rep representing his community, but we see, you know, uh, what could be labeled as, you know, like a white girl from rural Indiana and a black boy from urban Indiana, um, actually, you know, breaking down what it means to be tokenized and representing not just themselves, but this collective that is the best of Indiana, I think, and really is relational and able to create change if we truly try and see the complexity of one another and understand the representation, but not the tokenization. Well, that's really helpful, Lauren. And that's a great point about, do can we weaponize tokenizing and, and can we flip the script a little bit? And while you were explaining and, and Legend was explaining the recent developments, I did drop a link to a, a Chalkbeat article in the chat for folks who'd like to dig in more, but I thought you both captured it beautifully. It's a very complex issue and you made it simpler. I don't know why we always make things so hard. Daniel, when we were talking at the beginning about your own advocacy drivers, the things that really get you up in the morning, you mentioned um, anti-racism work, 
you mentioned LGBTQ work. Can you talk a little bit about what's next? Do you have kind of an advocacy wish list of things that you really think Indiana needs to act on soon? Yes, I I definitely I, um, when I when I get the majority of the work with this racism issue done, I want to quickly move on to the LGBTQ the LGBTQ work because it's come to my attention that that there is there is not enough support for LGBTQ people in in my city particularly in Gary I don't know if it's like that for the entirety of Indiana but for my city I know for sure we need a lot more support for this because as an LGBTQ person I have realized that I I, I have not gotten the support that I really needed and I kind of I kind of touch on that in the racism article that I'm writing but it's not entirely focused on the LGBTQ aspect of me but the support we we need a lot more of that and I I'm surrounded by primarily African American people and we have our own issues regarding LGBT regarding the LGBTQ community with the stereotype that that we're a very homophobic race and there's no getting out of that and I think people people have become a little too comfortable with that idea. And I really want to break that out and give a lot more help to people who are like me. Do you think, Daniel, that there is a role for schools since we've been talking about education? Is there a role for schools in helping provide community supports for LGBTQ youth especially? There is absolutely a role for school. In fact, like before all of this, all of this COVID stuff happened, I was literally about to start I was going to suggest starting a program at my school for this and get uh, a bunch of my friends who are also LGBTQ to help out and like lead this thing. I believe if we're going to do this, it definitely has to start with the youth because like I don't I don't want to stereotype Gen Z, but we can be very, very, very out there when we when we want stuff done. And I know that if if I had started that program, I could have like revolutionized something right there. So yeah, I think school school definitely needs to get a program started. They definitely need to get youth leading it. And then like the entirety of the, the cities that the schools are in, maybe like one by one, we start working together, start integrating that into like, into um, legislation or something like that. I don't know, but we definitely need to start coming together and doing something about it. Thank you, Daniel. That's so important. You opened a door. It's perfect. Legend, I want to talk to you about Gen Z. I have it on trusted authority that this is something that you like to talk about. I uh, am 43, so I'm a Gen Xer. And they told us that we were such slackers. We were never leaving the basement. We were lazy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of it probably came to pass and some of it didn't. But I personally have been really excited and impressed by Gen Z's ability to mobilize and organize. And that's, you know, I'm painting with a broad brush. I don't know all the Gen Zers, but things are going to have to work differently. COVID has taught us that, as Daniel's pointed out. Life changes, right? This is the point of having seasons and talking about generations. What do you think Gen Xers and millennials and older lawmakers are going to have to start doing differently if, if Gen Z has anything to say about it? How should they work differently? How do we need to change? Oh, that feels like a a really heavy, like a loaded question. Um, so for myself personally, I know that I am not at all interested in legalism um, or anything that's going to, any kind of structure that's going to continue to perpetuate hierarchies. And that goes down to like the clothes that we wear. Um, Lauren kind of kind of teased me in a real, you know, when we went to the state house, kind of like, remember to dress professionally, like <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a time and a day to take down the patriarchy and it might not be when you're advocating for school funding. Um, uh, and, and, you know, this is also wrapped up in each other as far as, you know, what, gosh, as far as like, we live in a very capitalistic system. I don't know. I feel like I could just like bounce from thing to thing. Um, I, very much, I think that what what I can what I expect out of Gen Z um, is uh, obviously a huge push for environmental justice. Um, as far as like if if current lawmakers 
you know, want to stay in their positions, um, getting with the pro, you know, I'm very much uh, an abolitionist for um, Citizens United, right? Is that that's the right thing? Um, I don't think that needs to stick around long. Like I'm ready for like myself and uh, the oldest of Gen Z to get into um, elected positions. And I think that there will hopefully be a huge change in who and how our elected politicians um, supported financially. Um, I, I'm also like my own little like thing is like, I wanna see the, <laughs> the abolition of the 40 hour work week or like the, this structured work week, right? I think we've all felt through COVID. Um, why are we not focusing our lives around the home? And how can different industries um, better support families? Uh, I, for one week, I like had a 13 year old that my husband and I were, were watching for the, for the week. And I went to babysitting. Um, he lived with us for a week, we took him to school. And I had to go late to work every single day to make sure he got to school. And I'm like, what are we doing? What are we doing wrong? Whereas like start, start, in, start times for work and end times work aren't matching up with like where people's children are. Um, so I, I don't know, I could, uh, of course there are, you know, pros and cons to kind of everything we do. One thing that I've kind of learned is that with every, you know, every like, oh, I'd love to see this change. Um, there's usually a, a group that's mixed in, that's going to get hurt by something. And, um, we it's, you can't always see where those, those lines are. And that's why it's so important to practice radical listening when someone comes to the table and says, the thing that you're doing is hurting me, whether it's what you're saying or um, this action, to practice radical listening and hearing that from you know, people who are in the margins and then integrating that into how we live. Um, I feel like I could go on all day long about that. Um, and I wanted to piggyback on what Daniel said as far as like advocating for LGBTQ, um, IA plus youth in school, we need comprehensive sex education. That's the next thing. So <laughs> this is great. This is really working out for me. My mom was a sex ed teacher, which was mortifying at 13. But in my old age, I think this is great. Like this is you got to start early talking about this stuff. So uh, not for nothing. I agree. And and I like the points you make, Legend. I think what COVID has taught us is that we can break apart some systems that we have long thought were immutable in this country, whether that's a work week or a physical space or to Daniel's point, the way school works. But we have to be willing to do a lot of work once we're in this broken space, right? Really practice radical listening and pick and choose the policy levers uh, that we can change when we can change them. And, and I do think a lot of it is youth and a lot of it is generational progress and that's always good. And I think Gen Z has some powerful allies uh, along the spectrum, across ages and groups to bust up some of these systems that obviously aren't working. If they were working, uh, we wouldn't have seen this great schism that Daniel highlighted when COVID you know, really revealed and exacerbated so many of these inequities that are so long standing. Kia, I want to come to you because we actually talked about this in, in the first Inside Out episode we did together. And there's a link to that first episode in the chat for those who missed it. Kia, we talked about showing up quote, professionally. And, and you mentioned what Lauren said, and, and I think that's a good point. It is a very fine line, threading a needle to show up professionally because your professionalism is often being judged by someone who isn't your age, isn't your gender, isn't your race. Kia, what advice do you give to the, the folks at Voices or would you give to people in the audience, especially younger people, about showing up to engage with policymakers, maintaining your authenticity, and being aware of some of these trip wires? You know, you know, it's just, that's a hard one. You know, I, I told this story last time when I was in college and I got my first job as a juvenile probation officer and I had this massive fro, right? I mean, I had worked hard to get this fro as big as it was. And so I interviewed, had the internship and I got the job and then I put a perm in my hair so that it was straight. I walk into the office, they're like, what the hell did you do to your hair? Why, what, what happened? We loved your Afro. And I just thought that that's what, you know, was required of me to be in this corporate environment. And, you know, that was the first lesson. They were like, we didn't care about your hair. It was your passion. It was your education. It was your drive. Like who cares, you know, but even now, like in the spaces that I'm in, you know, I have locks, you know what I'm saying? And so I'm going into these predominantly white male spaces and it's, it is a thing that I'm aware of, 
um, that I'm like, well, are they taking me serious? You know, my, my t-shirt says protect black youth and, or, you know what I mean? And I, my hair's in locks and, you know, it is a thing, but my, recently my daughter got some braids um, in her hair and they were lime green and I lost my mind. I'm like, who in the world, what, we're, no, we don't do, that's not how we show up. And she was like, why? And it was just the way that she said it. I'm like, you know what? You're absolutely right. Because you have green hair does not mean that you are less intelligent or less capable. Um, I think it's just the way that I was raised in the time period. You know, I'm still in that, you know, that space of you have to show up a certain way. But I think this younger generation is getting it right. You know, long as you are authentic, long as you are who you are, you know, that's not saying be half naked in courtrooms and things like that. <laughs> but I think, you know, they're, they're, they're getting it right. I think it's us. I just turned 40 last week that needs to kind of start, you know, seeing things a little bit differently and giving space to people just literally showing up who they are. I know in New Orleans, they just passed the Crown Act. Um, that is a, the, the, the fact that you needed to pass an act for black women to wear their hair naturally to work still, I'm, I'm still stuck there, um, but it got passed. And then we know what happened with the anchor woman in New York, you know, who got all of this went viral because her hair was in a natural state. And so, you know, that's an, always an odd balance for me, you know, being raised um, kind of old school, but I am definitely learning <laughs> through my kids and through, the young people that we're working with, that it's much more important just to be authentically you. Um, that is what's going to outweigh anything. So it's it's a growing process, um, and we will keep it moving. <laughs> That's terrific insight. That's great advice. And and Kia, I agree with you. I think the the young younger folks are doing it right. I think we're really on the cusp of something great. So we are heading into, into the last five minutes, which I can't believe time tends to fly with these because they're so great. But Daniel and Legend, I'm going to ask each of you to take us out by giving us a magic wand wish. So you have a magic wand for a day to change one policy or program or thing about the way Indiana runs for young folks, any young folks you pick. How do you spend that magic wand moment? What one policy? would you like to see change that you think really changes lives for any youth in Indiana, but especially those who are systems involved or marginalized in some way? So I'm gonna take a, a long dramatic, I'm gonna take a Daniel pause, a thoughtful pause. Give you a chance to chew on that. Okay, I know. Legend, go um, for it. As far as policy in this magic wand is uh, a heavy lifter. <laughs> um, for Indi in Indiana, I would see um, a huge up and efficient public transit. Transportation is a huge obstacle um, for people getting out of poverty, getting to school, getting from jobs, getting to the grocery store. Um, I would, you know, make more walkable communities. Uh, in the, you know, the United States is so reliant on cars. So if I could do that, this is a heavy lifting wand. I would make our communities much more walkable and more affordable or free, um, efficient public transit. That's a good one. Daniel, how do you use your magic wand? Okay, I'm still new to all of this politics and, lot and legislation stuff, so I don't really have an opinion to give you on, on that kind of thing, but I do, I would definitely wish that people would be a lot more welcoming to people as a whole. I feel like we have like shut out a lot of people's stories or opinions or experiences in a way that's just really not not good for people. And I think we need to be just like more open to everybody's experiences, whether you like agree with their views or disagree with them as a whole. Like I, I believe that one thing that definitely needs to change is how we welcome the individual people that we deal with. That's a great one. And I, I think that is kind of a policy, a piece of policy advice. Who's at the table and how do you let them come in? Do you, do you reschedule the hearing four times? 
Do you make the space welcoming and accessible? Do you make sure there are rides? Do you make it free? Or do you require a very particular kind of archaic approach that, that might shut out people who've never done it before? I think one of the least welcoming spaces in this country can be a city county building, right? You're going to pay a traffic ticket or learn something or register for something, or maybe you need to go to a court hearing. Those spaces are not meant to make you walk in and, and feel like you are in charge of what's about to happen. And, and I think you make a really good point. The more we're welcoming people as they are and um, thinking differently about how big our tables can get. We always like to say, oh, we don't want it to get too big when we're planning a policy. And then we end up leaving out a lot of folks. Um, we do have a few minutes. And so I'm not going to let Kia and Lauren off the magic wand hook. So Kia, I'm going to come to you first. How do you use your policy magic wand? That's a hard one. There's so many different areas. Um, my magic wand, honestly, would be to start over, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, last year for us, you know, me as a mom raising three young black men um, and, the, you know, the majority of the youth that we work with here locally in Marion County are young black men. Um, and, you know, it was such a heavy emotional lift last year to walk them through what they were seeing in the media just recently, a couple of days ago. And, you know, my oldest son is 18 now and I'm supposed to release him into this space, you know? And I'm like, how do you do that? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavy lift um, in this space, professionally and personally. And it feels more and more the same thing that my parents talked about, you know, going through the civil rights era um, is that some of these, none of these systems are designed for everybody. And so if we start there, we need to start over. <laughs> and so I think that's where my magic wand would be used. I think that is a wand well spent for sure. Lauren, bring us on home. What's your magic wand? Love this, Molly, because you are holding us accountable the way I try to hold myself accountable. If I ask youth a hard question, I'm like, ooh, I have to answer that. Oh, intimidating. And you bond and you empathize and you work through it. Um, I don't remember what I said last time, which is um, I wish I did because I, you know, I should probably have some consistency there. Um, I want general annual income that has an addendum about um, needing to have some sort of gun regulation tied to it. Um, we know, you know, Key and I both know that the number one reason people say they have guns is because everyone else does. Um, and so I think if there's some way to both interrogate and address um, you know, deep, deep wealth and income inequity um, based on race in particular um, to actually give folks opportunity that isn't illegal or tied to some sort of choice, um, you know, uh, that is actually out of unselfish reasons, but um, may cause harm or, you know, a criminal uh, offense. Um, I think if we can tie that in with the fact that um, we have way too many guns and we need to move legislation fast and strong, um, that would be my, my wish. I think that's a great way to bring us home because it's a message of keeping young people safe, keeping each other safe, keeping black men safe in this country. And these are all things that we should all commit energy to do. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I wanna to especially thank Lauren and Kia and Daniel and Legend for sharing their time and sharing their insights. I wanna thank all of you for coming and let you know that if you registered for the event, we'll push out a transcript and a recording. And we hope that you'll share the recording with people that you know. And we hope that you'll remind the people around you that as we say in this Youth America series, youth belong at the policymaking table. There's really no good reason to not involve them deeply in design. It doesn't have to be com complicated. It doesn't have to be uh, strange and, and kind of foreign. It just needs to be practical. And the people who practically know how to do this are the people who are living it every day. So that is a message from New America to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you next time.